Hi. Hello, welcome. This is Let's Talk About Myths, baby. And I'm Liv, that woman who talks. So, tis the season for those Spotify wrap-up lists. And let me just tell you all how much it's thrilled me to hear from you. To be honest, I kind of needed it. Numbers have been weirdly going down for the past couple of months. And so for someone who really wants to be able to do all this full-time and produce more, better episodes, downloads are key, and it was kind of bringing me down. But to know that so many of you listened to so much of the podcast and listened to so much more of my podcast than any other this year, honestly, I couldn't be happier that I have the most awesome listeners in the whole world, and you've just made me feel really great. So thank you all so much. And thank you for sharing those lists because I have been living for them. Also, just a quick note to say that there will be an episode next week on the 17th. But after that, I'm taking two weeks off from the podcast. The show falls on like I should have to release one on Christmas Eve and New Year's Eve. So I'm giving myself a break, a break that should also include coming up with some Patreon content while I'm not doing the regular podcast. So that at least will be very good. I'm so sorry that's been behind. You're all wonderful for being patrons, but it's because I've finally been able to finalize my book and hope to send it off to see who will publish it soon. So in return for that patience, because you're all wonderful, I'll find some way of rewarding patrons when it comes to the novel whenever I can. I promise. Anyway, we're back with that incredible, iconic, witchy woman, Medea. Please also stay tuned at the end of this episode, because after the second installment of Things the Western World Didn't Do First, I have an incredible addition to Medea's story. A listener sent me a song that she wrote about Medea, and I'm not just trying to be nice when I say that I really, really loved it, like Goosebumps loved it, and so I asked her if I could play it on the episode, so stay tuned for that. Well, without further ado, let's delve back into the story of one of my favorites, the badass witch herself, Medea. Where we last left Medea, she'd done some pretty horrible things to Peleus and his daughters, but she'd also flown around the world on a dragon-drawn chariot, collecting ingredients like the super cool fucking woman that she is. So, I mean, I'm a fan. I should say, to the dragon chariot uh, at the beginning like that, that's from Ovid. You should pretend, when it comes to me reading this Euripides part, that you just didn't know about it, because it was shocking for Euripides' audience. But yes, so Peleus sent Jason on the quest for the Golden Fleece in the first place, a quest that was absolutely supposed to kill Jason and would have if not for Medea. So Peleus is no saint. What I'm saying is it's fine that she helped kill him. His daughters probably didn't deserve what happened, though. Medea and Jason have traveled to Corinth one way or another and settle there. They have two sons together, and they're happy for a while, a few years at least, before Jason gets restless. Jason grows more and more aware that the woman he's married is not one of them. She's not Greek. This is episode 67, Woman, Survivor, Murderer, Euripides' Medea. Medea and Jason live in Corinth for a time, happily we're led to believe, but eventually that changes And that is how Euripides begins his play, the best play. The play opens by humanizing Medea, her nurse, and so a woman opens the play by lamenting that any of this ever started in the first place. She wishes that Jason had never sailed on the Argo, had never reached Colchis, that Medea had never gone with him. None of this would have happened. Medea wouldn't have killed Peleus, and they would not have ended up in Corinth. This play would have been performed in Athens at the festival held annually where playwrights would have their plays performed and would compete with one another for first, second, and third prize. So Athenians watched this, and Athenians had their own opinions of Corinth. That city itself was foreign to these Athenians because, remember, Greece was not a unified place. They were all Hellenic people, but they were all very separate and not always appreciative of one another. So this in itself would have been a foreign story about foreigners, and then Medea would have been a foreigner in that foreign city. The nurse laments, and she tells us what's happened. Jason is a traitor to Medea, to his wife. We can understand from this that perhaps Jason never considered Medea to be his true legal wife, 
as they would have married in Colchis in a ceremony between themselves and foreigners. It was foreign and not Greek, and so not necessarily legitimate if he didn't want it to be. Jason is a traitor, an oath-breaker. He's taken to the bed of Glauca, the princess of Corinth. The nurse tells the audience how Medea is taking this betrayal. Not well. She won't eat or sleep, won't move even. She calls out to the gods to witness what Jason has done. He's broken a sacred oath, one of the worst things a person can do. The nurse worries. Medea doesn't seem to have any love left, even for her children. The nurse worries she may even take her own life. When Medea's nurse finishes her lament, the children arrive with their tutor, who suggests to the nurse that there's more misery still in store for Medea. He's overheard someone discussing Creon, the king of Corinth, and his plan. He's going to drive Medea and the children from the city. He means to get rid of them, to ensure Jason can marry his daughter Glauca without the stain of his other foreign, illegitimate in their eyes, wife and children. Jason, it seems, no longer feels a duty to Medea nor to their children. He's done with her, giving her up for a younger Greek princess. And with Medea go their children. He can have more royal Greek children with this princess. Jason is an actual piece of shit, and Euripides has no qualms in telling his audience as much. But the tutor tells the nurse that she mustn't tell Medea. It's not the time yet for Medea to know what will happen. Even he wasn't supposed to know, let alone to tell the nurse. So Medea's nurse must keep this secret to herself for now. The nurse doesn't hide how she feels, though. She even calls out to the children to tell them what a dirtbag their father was, though she's a bit more eloquent in her phrasing. Finally, the nurse tells the children to run along inside, and she tells their tutor to keep them away from their mother. She's angry, wrathful, and the nurse worries for Medea and the children. She's seen a look in Medea's eyes when she looks at her children recently, and it isn't good. Medea's cries ring out from within her home, though the audience doesn't see her yet. She cries out about her pain and her misery while the nurse stands on stage, calling back, comforting Medea, but also vocalizing her fear for the children and their innocence in the whole matter. Finally, the chorus arrives. Every Greek play must have a chorus, and this one is Corinthian women, just adding to the sheer volume of women that would have appeared on stage in this play. Though, sadly, I must remind you that women didn't actually get to play women. Regardless, the intention is to have a stage full of women, sympathetic women. The Corinthian women appear, asking the nurse about the cries of Medea that they've been hearing. They feel for her, they tell the nurse, they feel no pleasure at her pain, they're friends. This is a stage full of women supporting other women in a dark time. It reminds the audience that Medea is just a woman. She's been living a woman's life in Corinth, which means keeping to herself or with the others, staying in her space. She's a woman that's completely beholden to a man who's just decided that he just doesn't want her anymore. Women in ancient Greece were bought and sold. There was a dowry system. A woman was owned by her father until she was owned by her husband. So a woman who's been married to a man and that man hasn't died, but also doesn't want to be around her anymore, that woman is in a kind of limbo. She isn't unmarried because there isn't divorce, but she can't stay with her husband and she can't return to her father. So what is she supposed to do? Jason isn't just betraying Medea because he doesn't love her anymore and she should just move on. This isn't a breakup. This is abandonment in the literal sense of the word. She's quite literally ruined by Jason's decision to choose a Greek woman and to pretend that the foreign woman he married was never a marriage in the first place. That's the decision he's made because he's not just allowed to get divorced to pick a new wife, he's saying that no, his marriage to Medea was never legitimate to begin with, so he can just leave. He's an actual piece of shit. The chorus is on her side, though. After listening to Medea, they call out to Zeus, saying exactly this. Jason has left her for a new wife, so they call on Zeus to be Medea's avenger. 
To this, though, Medea invokes not Hecate like she has earlier in our story, before Euripides took hold of it, but Themis and Artemis. Themis, guardian of oaths and social sanctions, and Artemis, perhaps because she's the goddess of the hunt, or maybe Medea is calling on her status as virgin goddess. Regardless, Medea isn't summoning magic here. She isn't calling the Furies to go after Jason for breaking his oath. She's calling on logic and reason. She knows she's in the right here, and the goddesses she calls upon can help. In making this choice, too, Euripides is making very clear that he wants his audience to be on Medea's side. They don't get an out here just because she's supposed to be foreign and other. She isn't some witch making potions and poisons to punish her wrongdoer. She's just a mortal woman like anyone else who's been betrayed. Medea calls to these women, these goddesses, hoping to see Jason and his new wife be ruined for wronging her without reason. She calls out to her father, Aetes, back in Colchis. Medea wishes she'd never left, that she'd never done something as horrible as killing her brother, all for this wretched man, Jason. Finally, Medea shows herself on stage. She appears to speak with the chorus of local women who are there in support of her. She seems stronger now, like she's gained strength and will since her cries were heard from the inside. She addresses herself as a stranger to Corinth and how it's important to fit in when that's the case. And that's why what Jason has done is so awful. She had a comfortable life where she finally felt at home in Corinth in Greece until Jason decided to blow it all up. Now, she tells the chorus, she longs for death, because the man who was everything to her is actually the worst of them all. Thus begins Medea's badass speech about being a woman in that world. Of everyone, women have it the hardest, she begins. From the start, we must have the money for a husband— And what she means is the woman's family must arrange a husband and pay him a vast sum of money, essentially just so that he'll take the woman off her family's hands. Worse, though, she says, is that with that marriage, the woman gets a master. A master of her own body in the form of a husband she's typically never even met before. Is that man good or bad? A woman can't know until it's too late. There's no escape, either. A woman can't deny her husband, nor can she leave. To clarify, there's no such thing as marital rape in ancient Greece, and the women have no out, no matter how horrific their husbands might turn out to be. The women must go to a new home, with new habits and rules, and they have to figure it all out without any guidance. It's not as though they learn anything about this home. They're simply thrust into a situation that they have to maneuver without any guidance at all, or often any patience from their new husband. If we do it right, she says, then there's a happy, enviable life. If not, death is better. When men are unhappy, she goes on, they can leave their homes, do whatever they want out in the world. But not women. They must stay in their spaces, often alone, and simply deal with it. She adds, they say we have it easy, staying at home while they go off to war, but they're so wrong. Medea says she'd rather stand behind a shield three times over than give birth just once. And she's not wrong. One in two women in ancient Greece died in their first childbirth. It's fucking life or death, being a woman, but it's never viewed that way. But, Medea says, addressing the chorus of Corinthian women specifically, things are not the same for you and me. You have this city and your father's homes. You have your lives and your friends. I'm on my own, she reminds them. I have no city. She tells the women that Jason abuses her, and that's after she was brought from her home as a prize won. She tells them that she has no family, no mother or brother, no one to give her shelter. So... She asks the chorus, Keep my secret. I've come up with a way of paying Jason back for what he's done. Women are full of fear, she adds, except when they're, quote, wronged in marriage, no minds more deeply stained with blood than hers. (laughs) 
Creon, the king of Corinth, and the father of Glauca, the princess Jason has decided to marry, arrives to speak with Medea. He doesn't beat around the bush, doesn't sugarcoat his intentions at all. I'm here to tell you you have to leave, he tells her. Right away. I won't go home until you're gone. Medea is, rightly, distraught. She's emotional enough without this asshole coming in and telling her she has to leave her home. And not only that, but where is she supposed to go exactly? She has no home in Greece. She's there because Jason brought her, promising her the world. She can't go home to Colchis. She killed her brother to escape, once again for Jason. She has nothing. Why are you making me leave? She asks Creon. He's blunt. I fear you. He tells her he's worried she might kill his daughter, and there's lots of evidence for this, he says. He tells her that she's clever, something obviously murderous in a woman, and that she has dangerous skills. Jason leaving you has brought you pain, he adds, and I've heard you're making threats. Essentially, Creon tells Medea he wants her gone before she can do anything to him, his daughter, or his new son-in-law. So often my reputation has hurt me. Medea tells Creon in response. Parents shouldn't over-educate their children, she says. They'll incur the jealousy and anger of their fellow citizens. She's basically saying she's too smart for this bullshit and that it's only led to people fearing her or mistrusting her. Medea, in this play, is just an incredible character with some fascinating things to say. Euripides clearly respects her as a woman and an intelligent, powerful woman at that. I would highly recommend this translation by Rachel Kitzinger because it's well done, but it's also by a woman, which I think is important when covering the classics in the time we're in now, but especially Medea. But Medea tries to placate Creon. You fear me, but why? She asks. I'm not one to hurt those in power, she tells him. It's my husband I'm mad at, not you or your daughter. You can celebrate their marriage. All I want is to stay here. I'll keep to myself and not make trouble, she assures him. But this doesn't convince Creon. He's worried about how calm she is, saying that's scarier than anger. No, he says you have to leave. Medea continues to try to make her case not to be exiled at all, but Creon doesn't flinch. Finally, though, she manages to convince him to let her stay just for the day, but he tells her that she must be gone by dawn of the next morning or she'll die. Medea's state, as she was talking to Creon, frantically begging for her and her children's livelihoods, that they not be cast out of their homes with nothing and no notice, her emotional plea for even a tiny bit of pity on the part of Creon, absolutely disappears once he's left. Well, that's it, she tells the chorus. He's lost his chance to stop my plan, my scheme. He's given me one more day, and that's one day to kill the three of them. She announces this without fanfare or drama. It's the facts. By not forcing her from Corinth in this very moment, Creon has sealed his fate, along with his daughter and Medea's husband. This is all the time she needs. He was right to be afraid of her. She is smart as hell. Medea begins to sketch out how she might kill Jason, Glauca, and Creon. Should she make it obvious and dramatic, lighting their bedroom on fire, stabbing them while they sleep— But where will she go if she does that? What city will take her? No, she determines she'll wait to figure out where she may be able to go and base the means of their murder around that. Will she need to make it stealthy in order to survive somewhere after? Or can she kill them with the dramatic bang that she so wishes to? She's angry now as she continues her speech, planning their death, psyching herself up, reminding herself who she is, who her grandfather is, and how she will not be forced into the shame and ruin that comes with Jason simply marrying Glauca and being done with it. Now she calls to Hecate as her aid in this righteous decision that she's made. In response to Medea's announcement here, the chorus has a badass ode to women in their world in which they live, how they might have been different had the gods gifted them differently, and the power they have even with their lot. I wish I could just straight recite it to you, but that's not allowed. So please read this translation. 
Once the chorus has finished this badassery, the shitbag in chief, lord of all that is awful and vile, Jason, arrives on stage to be an absolute piece of human garbage and an all around fucker. Jason comes on stage and manages to find a way to blame Medea for everything. Without any evidence given to us in the story, he tells her that it's all her fault, all this bullshit, because she's apparently been slandering the royals of Corinth. There's nothing to indicate that's true, and Jason isn't being portrayed in a good light here. Euripides clearly despises him just as much as the audience is supposed to. But he wants to blame Medea. He wants to appear as the good one, the one who tried to help her, to plead her case. But no, he says, you've done too much to avoid this exile. But I won't disown the children, he tells her, as if he's doing her a huge fucking favor. I'll give you money for your exile, he says, seriously, as if he's helping her. He's the fucking good guy. I think I've said this before, but I used to think Theseus was the worst of the heroes, but I think there's a very good case to be made that it's Jason. Sure, Theseus abandons Ariadne on an island, but then she falls for a god, so that's not half as bad as the utter bullshit that Medea has to put up with. Honestly. And just like me, Medea is not having any of Jason's fuckery. You're the worst, she really does say. Worst of the worst, actually. There's no bravery in coming to stand in front of the family you've ruined, she tells him. And she goes off. I'll start at the beginning, she says. I saved you all on the Argo when you were sent to Colchis to perform the deeds against my father in your quest for the Golden Fleece. You'd be dead ten times over if it weren't for me. I betrayed my father and killed my brother all for you. I killed Peleus all for you. And after all of this, everything I've done for you, you betrayed me in this way? This most horrific way? She clarifies, too, that it's the fact that they have children that makes this as awful as it is. She could forgive him for lusting after another woman had they been childless, but we have children, and still you've taken on a new wife. Medea continues to go off on Jason, being super fucking blunt about all the shit he's put her through. Where should I go? She asks him. I betrayed my family. Can't go back to them. Maybe I should go to Iolcus to see Peleus' daughters. I bet they'd love to see my face. Jason forced her to make enemies of people she shouldn't have, that she didn't need to if it weren't for him. And now she's being banished into a world where she's hated by so many, all because he got fucking horny and racist and wanted himself a nice Greek princess to fuck instead of her. When Medea has finished her speech in all her hatred of Jason, he is ready to come back at her with some more of his utter shit. Empty talk, he calls it. First of all, he says, in what I imagine is a whiny shithead kind of voice, it wasn't you who saved me so many times on the voyage of the Argo. It was Aphrodite. What? You may have asked yourself. Yeah. Jason is one of those toxic guys on the internet, Twitter probably, who are there to explain why you're wrong about everything when their answer is really utter insanity and reaching. His point is that, get this, Aphrodite is actually the one who saved his life so many times because it was Aphrodite who caused Medea to fall in love with him in the first place. So it was Aphrodite who brought Medea along for the ride. Yeah. So Medea still saved him a zillion times, but like it wasn't really her doing because she wouldn't have been there to save him if it weren't for Aphrodite. It's such an insane level of insanity I just cannot with this man. But he isn't done either. Let me tell you all the ways I really helped you, he says after noting it was Aphrodite who saved him. Number one. You're in Greece now, and you should feel so grateful to live in this civilized region rather than your savage homeland. Now you know justice and rule of law. So Jason is also one of those racist shitheads on Twitter who say that immigrants shouldn't be allowed to criticize their new country. They should just be grateful that they're allowed to live in a place that's so much better from where they came from. Plus, he adds, you're famous here. If you were still living in your homeland, no one would even know who you are. You're really just lucky that I brought you here to this much better place and then abandoned you. You're definitely better off. God, you guys, he's so awful. And the speech keeps going. I have to stop myself from laying it all out. But let me also tell you that he says he's been a great friend to her and the children. The children, not his children, the children. And he actually tells her to calm down at one point. His main point, though, 
is that he's marrying Glauca to help Medea and the children. He'll have children with Glauca and will make royal brothers for his children with Medea. So won't they be better off then? Two families in one. Finally, he says, what he's really learned is that mortals should find a way to reproduce without women. That women shouldn't exist at all. And there'd be no more trouble. Well, this episode is going to be long. I can't stop myself. They argue, with Medea rightfully pointing out that everything Jason is doing, he's doing for himself, and Jason countering with the continuing insane argument that no, he's married Glauca to help Medea, and he's going to have more children to help his children with Medea. Like, isn't that obvious? He tells her it's her own fault that she's going to exile alone. Doesn't she want his money? If not, she should just say so. He's only here to help her. Oh, isn't he helpful? He's not in the wrong at all. Jason is a good boy who isn't doing anything wrong. Oh, don't we appreciate Jason? Medea tells Jason to fuck right off with his pity money. And he does. And, oh, what next? What a coincidence! In walks Aegeus, king of Athens, who just happens to be walking by Medea's home on his way out of Corinth. How very lucky. Aegeus has been to speak with the Oracle, and is now traveling through Corinth on his journey. Why did you have to speak with the Oracle? Medea asks Aegeus after they've greeted each other, Medea showing none of her distress. I asked the Oracle how I might have a child, he tells her. You don't have a wife? she asks in return. Aegeus confirms, no, he isn't married. He tells her that the Oracle told him not to loose the wineskin before returning to your ancestral home. That's the Oracle. He goes on to tell Medea that he's now going to see the king of the land of Trozen, who he helps will be able to help him understand what the oracle has said. They chat about this man, and Medea wishes Aegeus well. But it's then that he notices that she doesn't look quite as happy, quite as full of life as usual. He asks her, what's wrong? And she tells him. She tells him that her husband is awful, that he's wronged her, though she's done nothing wrong, that he's put a new wife above her. Aegeus is shocked. This is truly one of the more troubling things a person can do, and he can barely believe it. Medea goes on to tell him about her own exile because of Jason's treachery. She begs him. Would he accept her in Athens once she's forced out into exile? She tells him that should he help her, she'll wish to the gods that his desire to have children be fulfilled, that he'll live happily before dying peacefully. She tells him that she even knows a cure for his childlessness— She can help him. He tells her he's more than happy to help. She's made such an appealing case. When you get to Athens, he says, I'll try to get you protection. But he tells her he can't agree to bring her from Corinth. She needs to reach Athens on her own, and then she'll be safe. Medea's happy with that, but she needs more. Guarantee me of this promise, she asks him. She tells him she's worried about the houses of Peleus and Creon and what they might do to her. Make this oath so I'm protected, she asks Aegeus. He's happy to. He respects her forethought in this plan, and he swears by the gods that he will help her when she reaches Athens in her exile, that he won't expel her from the city or return her to her enemies. Once Aegeus has left and Medea has secured this very important oath from him, she can continue her planning. This is all she needed, guaranteed safety once she's done what she plans to do. And here, Aegeus just wandered onto the scene, ready to give her exactly what she needs. So, she lays out her plan to the chorus, telling them exactly what she'll do, how she'll kill Glauca, and then her very own children. They, of course, want to stop her. They tell her they forbid this act. She understands. She says they haven't suffered like her, but this is the only way. So Medea sends one of her slave women, that it's a woman is made clear, to bring Jason to her so that she might put her plan into action. And before long, he arrives. What do you want? He asks Medea. 
She's a changed woman now. Medea begs for Jason's forgiveness. She's so very sorry for how she spoke to him. She was angry, and he put up with her anger so well. She tells him that she knows now that he's trying to do good by her and by their children. That he's obviously trying to help her by marrying Glauca and having more children with her. She explains that women are silly and he mustn't trouble himself with us, but that she wants to do better. So she calls into the house for the children, and out they come with their tutor in tow. Children, say hi to your father. Don't be angry at him. I've forgotten all my anger, she tells her kids. Oh, kids, why don't you give your dad a hug? Finally, we're free of his anger. There's no more of it. Everything is forgiven and everything is fine. Jason, very, very proud of himself, tells the children of his plan to give them brothers so that they can all grow up to be leaders of Corinth. Oh, how lucky they'll be. Medea now asks Jason if he'll take pity on his children and try to convince Creon to allow them to stay in Corinth, even if Medea herself must be exiled. Surely the children can stay. Jason agrees. Medea's flattery has done wonders for his ego. He tells her he'll work to persuade Creon and Glauca that the children should stay and be raised in Corinth. Oh, thank you, Medea tells Jason sweetly. I'll help, too. I'll send gifts for Glauca with the children, beautiful gifts that they'll give her, and certainly that will help to convince her that they are worthy enough to stay in Corinth. She gets the beautiful gifts that she says were once given to her by the son himself, her grandfather. Oh, how worthy these gifts are of the princess. Jason tries to convince Medea to keep these for herself, that Glauca doesn't lack in clothing. But no, Medea's being generous. Anything to help her children stay in Corinth, she says. Glauca will certainly appreciate them. To her children, she instructs that they must only hand the gifts over to Glauca herself, and to make sure she takes them with her own hands. Later, the tutor arrives with the children, returned from the palace. The children are allowed to stay, he tells Medea triumphantly. The bride has received the gifts, he tells her, and she was happy to allow the children to stay. At this, Medea cries out, ay, ay. Why are you crying? The tutor asks. I've brought good news. But she only cries again in response. He continues to ask her what's wrong, and she's vague saying only that she's crying over what she and the gods have planned. Finally, Medea directs the tutor to bring the children inside the house. But before he can, she speaks to them. Oh, children, now there's a city and a home here to welcome you. You'll live here happily, though without your mother. She laments that she must leave before seeing them happy, seeing them married. She's spiraling, crying over her children and the things she won't get to see them do, the experiences she won't get to witness with them, that they won't care for her when she's old, that they won't see her at all. But then she starts to speak more vaguely. The tutor and the children don't understand her. She starts talking about the plans she's made before and getting rid of those plans that she'll take the children. Why must she hurt their father by hurting them? No, I won't do it, she announces. In an instant, though, she's reversed again. Can I allow my enemies not to be punished in the shame that would cause me? What cowardice to even let myself consider not going on with the plan this far along? No, she says. Go inside the house, children. If anyone thinks it's wrong, what I plan to do, they can mind their own business. I'm going to do it. Once the children are out of earshot, she doubts herself again, more violently now. She can't bring herself to do it. She doesn't really want to hurt them. She just sees no other way of punishing Jason for what he's done. She's been put in an absolutely horrific situation. She's been utterly, completely ruined by the decisions of one man. And how can she hurt him most? By killing everything he loves. She also recognizes in the dialogue that if she didn't kill them, they would be the ones punished for her killing the princess, and by killing them herself, she's sparing them a worse punishment by the palace and by the people of Corinth. It's not something we can understand now, and probably wasn't necessarily something they could understand then. But throughout this story, Medea is portrayed as a sympathetic character. 
Yes, she's planning these murders, including of her own children, but it's out of desperation, of a feeling like she's trapped and there's no other way out of the situation that she was put in by outside forces. Euripides doesn't judge her and isn't asking the audience to. He makes it clear it's Jason who deserves punishment and this is what Medea has to do. By making Medea so sympathetic too, and making her fit in so well with the people of Corinth, specifically the chorus, he's, like I said earlier, he's not giving the audience an out, a reason to hate her because she's foreign or to think she's able to kill these people because she's just some crazy barbarian. He makes perfectly clear that she is just like the rest of them. There's no brewing of a potion, no reciting of magic spells. She's not an other. She's not a foreigner with barbarous tendencies. She's a woman with abilities placed in a horrific position who has to sacrifice in order to free herself. Euripides is awesome and by far the most sympathetic tragedy when it comes to the plight of women in his time. This entire play is an ode to how women are treated and how unfair it usually is. Just before the children reach the door to their house, Medea rushes over to them. She gives them hugs and kisses, tells them, may they both be happy wherever they are. Without using the words exactly, she tells them just how much she loves them, and she apologizes for what she's going to do. Once the children have gone inside, the chorus sings a beautiful song about the plight of parents whose children die. Then a messenger. Medea sees a messenger in the distance, an attendant of Jason running up to her. You have to go, he tells her in a rush as soon as he reaches her. Get out of here. What's happened? she asks. The bride and her father, the king, they're dead, killed by you and your poisons. That's wonderful to hear, she tells the man. From now on, you'll be one of my closest friends. The messenger calls her mad for what she said, but she tells him, no, she has her own tale to tell in all this, but... Tell me what's happened to them. How did they die? You'll make me so happy by telling me the terrible details. When your sons arrived in the palace, many of the slaves were happy for you. We knew how badly you've suffered. We were glad to hear you had resolved things with Jason. Everyone working in the palace was so happy to see the children. I followed them up to see Glauca. She saw only Jason at first and gazed at him. When she finally saw the children, though, it was clear she was disgusted by their being there. Jason tried to change her mind to have her look at the children and accept their gifts. Those she couldn't resist, and happily she took the robe and the crown from the children. Before we'd even left, she'd taken both items and put them on, admiring herself in the mirror as she spun around. She began to walk around the room, happily showing off her gifts vainly, until she turned a different color and let out a horrible scream. She stumbled, falling on a chair nearby as white foam began to bubble from her mouth. Servants rushed to get the king and to get Jason, who had left the room by this time. By the time the others had arrived, though, she was back standing up and crying out in horrible, suffering pain. The crown on her head let out a stream of fire, and the robe was tearing apart the princess's white skin. She tried to get it off of her, but both were stuck on tightly. She couldn't free herself from her fate. Finally, she fell to the floor. She was unrecognizable, a lump of flesh and bone, a skin oozing off of her, loose off her bones. No one wanted to touch her for fear of the poison on the robe and the crown, but Creon, her father, rushed into the room and he hadn't seen anything that had happened to her. He went to her and wrapped himself around his daughter's body, calling out to her. We tried to pull him off of her, but he was stuck. He started crying out himself, screaming horribly as he tried to pull away from her body with our help. But it couldn't be done began to rip away at his own flesh, and he finally collapsed on top of his daughter's body, both gone silent and still. The messenger finishes, and immediately Medea plans her escape. She knows she has to get out of Corinth as fast as she can. She announces that she mustn't delay in killing her children. They can't escape their fate now. But now she must convince herself 
Medea begins to talk to herself, trying to talk herself into picking up the sword that she must use to kill her children. Even now, she isn't fully sure of her plan. Don't think of them as your children, she tells herself. Don't remind yourself that you gave them life, that you love them most of all. Forget that for now. Forget for now that they are your children. You can think about that and grieve later. And with that, Medea enters the house, sword in hand. The chorus calls out to her one last plea that this not take place, one last plea to Zeus to stop her. But the children's voices can be heard from within the house, and they cry out. The children, they call out to each other, wondering how they can escape their own mother, calling out to the gods. As the chorus laments what's taking place, Jason arrives at the house. He's there to confront Medea for what she's just done, for providing the horrific poison gifts that killed his new wife and her father. He asks the women assembled outside, the chorus, if Medea is still inside or whether she's already fled after what she's done. But he doesn't wait for an answer. He's got some ranting to do. He continues his woe is me act, his aren't I the best and what a victim I am act, and claims he's there because he's so worried about his children. Like Medea, he says he's worried about what the people of Corinth will do to them. He says he's there to save them. Of course, it's too late for that. The chorus tells him as much, and just as bluntly. Your children are dead, they say. He's distraught, or so he seems, but wasn't he only hours ago more than happy to allow his young children to be exiled along with his wife? Do we believe any of the shit that Jason spews from his mouth? Absolutely not. At this point in the story, there are no winners or losers. Jason is a piece of shit, but his children didn't deserve to be killed. Medea is a woman who was backed into a corner and did the only thing she felt she could, even if it was a horrific act that will haunt her for the rest of her life. Jason bangs on the door to the house, calling to the slaves inside. But before the doors can be opened so that he may see the scene inside, something unlike anything else ever performed in Greek tragedy happens. From above, Medea appears in her dragon-drawn chariot with the bodies of her children inside. This would normally be a moment of deus ex machina, ghost in the machinery, when the gods descend from on high at the end of a play to make pronouncements or wrap things up with a nice little bow. But not now. This is a mortal woman appearing where the gods are meant to, and with the bodies of her children, no less. The audience would have been in shock at this. It simply wasn't done. Not to mention the dragon chariot, which like I said came in Ovid later, so this was the first time they'd seen it. It was dragons drawing a chariot of a woman high up above, pulled in as if by magic. Stop your search, she tells Jason. Don't bang down the doors. Say what you want to me now, but you won't get me. I have this chariot given to me by the son himself, my grandfather, to keep me free from my enemies. Jason really just screeches at Medea. He makes some similar arguments that he has before, linking her with all women. All women are the bane of man's existence, is Jason's view. He goes on and on, not making any real points, just expressing his deeply toxic masculinity in a means that sounds righteous because of what Medea's just done, but isn't really. He's just feeling sorry for himself for being royally ruined by a woman he ruined in the first place. Medea knows herself, though. She knows that Zeus has seen all she's done for Jason, and that she doesn't need to worry about his anger or his taunts, or even the threat of the Arenaways, the Furies. She's done something awful, but in her mind, and in the minds of the gods, it wasn't completely unwarranted, and she will not be punished more than the required purification from a king, something she's already lined up. She explains that she will bury her sons, not Jason. That she will protect their tombs from violation. That she will set up a feast and rites in honor of their unholy death. She will do all she needs to to right this wrong. And she will go on to live with Aegeus in Athens. While Jason, she says, a bad man who will have a bad death, will be hit on the head with a piece of the Argo, and that will be that. Jason continues to scream at Medea as she flies off in her chariot, pulled by mechanisms in the air so that it truly looks like she's flying, like the gods, away and presumably to her savior. 
She's not the one to be punished, even for this deed. Euripides does not want us to hate her, just to feel sorry for the children that they ever had to be involved at all. She will not be hunted by the Furies, even though Jason calls on them for her. He is the breaker of oaths. She did what she had to, even if it was horrible. Medea is complex, but ultimately, we want to like her. We want to see her side, and that is why she is so interesting. This play is stunning. It's unbelievable in the way it was presented, the way it examines the role of women and the things they had to deal with in an incredibly blunt and powerful way. This translation is wonderful. I'd recommend you all read it. There's so much more that I can't say for time and because, you know, copyright. Medea, though, is something else, a badass witch queen who does what she needs to do while realizing just how horrible it is. She will work her whole life to make up for it, through honoring her children in whatever ways she can. And Jason is a bad man who will die a bad death. The most obviously misogynistic man in Greek mythology? Quite possibly. He's a real piece of work. Medea, meanwhile, what a character. And now for another installment of Things the Western World Didn't Do First, the segment that exists to detail things that are often attributed to the ancient Greeks or the ancient Romans as some sort of so-called proof that these cultures and by extension the so-called Western world is somehow superior or gave us the things we deem important today. This idea that we, as humans, wouldn't be where we are today without them because it's some dark shit. This time we're talking literature. That's right, a thing that people, including myself, take pretty fucking seriously. No, the Iliad and the Odyssey, while super fucking old and cool, weren't the first of anything. Nor were any of the other Greek men that wrote, be it poetry or biography. Nope, those guys didn't start anything either. Nope, this is an example where it's not only not Western people who started it, it's not even men who started it. That's fucking right. We're talking Eastern ladies today and their contributions to the first pieces of literature. And Hedwana was a Sumerian, a Mesopotamian priestess in the Sumerian city-state of Ur, in what is now Iraq. She was a badass and the first poet whose name we have recorded from about 4,200 years ago. Yeah. She wrote poems and hymns to the goddess Inanna, a badass who is basically Athena and Aphrodite combined, and who was later worshipped by the Babylonians and others as the goddess Ishtar, This made Enhedwana the first known author. Period. A woman. And a woman from Iraq. Plus, first novelist specifically, a Japanese woman named Murasaki Shikibu. She wrote closer to 1000 CE, so it's later than I'm usually discussing. But first novelist, a woman. Of course, there's much more early literature than just this. There are many recorded pieces from the early Bronze Age. All are either Sumerian, so modern Iraq, or Egyptian, which the Western world has kind of tried to take on as their own, but let's all be reminded that Egypt is in Africa, and Western people traveled there quite late, and the Greeks and Romans did take over, but so much later than when the Egyptians began their reign as ancient badasses. Same with the recorded works from the Middle Bronze Age, Mesopotamian and Egyptian, and it goes on. If you refer to a list, and fine, it's on Wikipedia, but I check citations when I read on Wikipedia. And this segment is out of my wheelhouse. You'll see that about 2,000 years worth of recorded works of literature before you reach Homer, Early Bronze Age, Middle Bronze Age, Late Bronze Age, and into the Iron Age, all mostly come from what we now consider to be the Middle East and Africa. Of course, the Epic of Gilgamesh is widely accepted to be the first work of great literature, the first epic. It's from Mesopotamia, about 1,000 years before Homer came along to take over the genre. Now, friends, nerds, wonderful listeners, as promised, here is the incredible song written by a listener about the incredible Medea and all the bullshit she went through, both what was done to her and what she did. It's by Allison Rush. Please enjoy, and you can hear more from Allison at allisonrush.com, that's one L, and via the Spotify link in the episode's description. That will take you to her first album, which has other classics-inspired songs. I really love this song, and I hope you'll all listen. Thank you. 
In my deepest heart of hearts, I saw this coming from the start. Saw beneath your perfect skin, your spine is weak, your blood is thin. The star that shivers when I bleed is all the family I need. It's almost time now, aren't you scared? You're so completely unprepared. Remember me when this is done. When my wings block out the sun, I saved a dozen dragon's teeth to sew discreetly underneath your eyelids while you sleep, my dear, in place of all the bitter tears. You never thought to spend on me. I'll give the world another see. I know exactly what to do. I will take everything from you except my army of the dead. Forever trapped inside your head. I'll make a pyre, make my peace. Some dirty wisps of golden fleece, serpent's venom, nail of bronze. I send my smoke into the dawn. The lock of hair, my brother's curls. Now here's something pretty for your pretty. Pretty girl, little creatures from my womb, where crocuses and hemlock bloom, they go on the fire too, because they are a part of you. Oh, thank you all for listening. This is a long one, so I won't keep you. You're all wonderful. Thank you for being so awesome. I am Liv, and I love this shit.